Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to our first general plan subcommittee for the City of San Mateo general plan update. My name is Charlie Knox. I work with a company called PlaceWorks. Uh, among the things we do are general plan updates, so hopefully you'll feel soon you're in good hands. Um, and before we get started, because this is a little bit different than going to a planning commission or sustainability infrastructure commission or council meeting, we've got everybody merged together. We're going to jump right in and then we'll, the committee members will do self-introductions and talk about their interests. So also with me from PlaceWorks and we're from the Berkeley office is Carrie Stone, who's the project manager for us. And city staff is here, Drew Corbett, our assistant city manager, um, Julia Klein, who's the project manager for the city. Ron Munakawa, the chief of planning over there behind the mayor, um, Sharon from, from planning, and Roscoe and Lily are out in the lobby, and Cameron is helping us um, record the meeting. And so all of these meetings will be recorded, so great to have you here, but if you can't make it or you want to go back and watch it again, or you have friends you want to have seen it, um, it'll be available on the city's website. Um, and our, we'll get to this in a slide later, but the branding for the project is called Strive San Mateo, so that's always an easy way to find it through any, any search engine. Um, next slide. So here is our packed agenda for the next two hours, and we are going to stay on schedule so we don't make you overcommit on a, on a school night. Um, I'll give you an overview of the meeting and the procedures. We will run this like any other Brown Act meeting uh, for the city. There will be a separate chance early on to, for anyone to comment on items not on the agenda that may be in the purview of the commission or the committee at some point. Um, there will also be public comment for each of the agendized items separately. Public comment is two minutes. Um, and then we'll get into how the subcommittee is set up. And then finally to the meat of the, of the um, meeting, which is what is the general plan update about? What is the general plan? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the issues and concerns? And then we'll give it over after that public comment to the committee for discussion. Here are our procedures. The meetings are recorded. Each meeting begins with roll call, so I guess we should do that when I'm done with this part, and an overview of the project. So if you miss a meeting or you bring in friends or colleagues that are new, you don't have to explain everything to them. They'll get a reintroduction each time. Um, you'll see we have eight meetings scheduled over the next two years. Uh, I mentioned public uh, comment, and um, just a reminder, um, we can say lots of things as a community. The, the committee is really only charged with certain things, so they may only be able to speak on the agenda items themselves. Next slide. Yeah, let's do roll call. Um, Commissioner Bonero. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Adam Lorraine. Here. Commissioner Ellen. Uh, Mal Mallory. 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 I'm, I'm here. Okay. Commissioner Cliff Roberts. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Aaron Slate. Here. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Council Member Eric Rodriguez. Here. And this is an opportunity for the committee members, many of whom you know and all know each other, to tell us which city board or committee they are on currently um, and we have some suggestions here that you might help us with starting to think about issues and concerns to address in the general plan and what, what that might mean for changes in the future. If you don't want to use those same words and you just want to tell us things that you like, dislike, you want to change or want to see conserved, please do so. And why don't we just start with Council Member Rodriguez and go down the line. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see a big crowd here. Um, <coughs> before I start introducing myself, I just want to say um, in, in 2015 when I was uh, appointed to the Planning Commission, one of the first things you do is read the, the general plan very thoroughly. And, try not, and I remember talking with Ron in one of my first meetings with him and saying, you know, when does this get updated? This is such an important document. And I remember him saying, well, it's due to be updated in about three to five years. And I remember thinking, wow, what an opportunity our community is going to have when that, when that comes about. And lo and behold, here we are, a chance to shape San Mateo's future. And I'm very excited. I'm sure every, every uh, committee member here is too. Um, I am a council member, and I'm also on the Civic Arts Committee. Um, I love San Mateo's energy. I love San Mateo's diversity of people. I love its neighborhoods. Um, it's, it's, a play, it's an ideal place to raise a family. It's an ideal place to, to uh, live here your entire life and not get bored. There's something to do for everybody. Um, I love its economic climate. I love Central Park. I love its library. Um, you know, I, I wish San Mateo, wow. Uh, I wish San Mateo can be a leader in tackling some of these major issues that we're facing. 
Um, and I'm sure they're going to come up again and again and again. Housing costs, traffic, um, quality, quality of our schools and, and the impacts on our schools, environmental impacts, um, car-centric transportation and trying to shift away from that. I really, I really wish that we as a group, as a community can come together and tackle these challenges in a very civil um, uh, way that we're, we're all knowing that we're trying to do what's best for our community. So I look forward to that happening. Thank you. Do you want me on that my name is Amrin Slee. Most people call me Ammo, so feel free to call, my, call me by my nickname. I am a mom. I have two school-aged children in the public schools. I am an entrepreneur. I built and sold a business. And prior to that, in my mom life, I ran nonprofits. And, and so my passion is community organizing right now and, and what I spend my time doing when I'm not in CERT class or the San Mateo City Services Academy or, let's see, um, the San Mateo County Civics 101 class <laughs> it is leading um, the Handsome, the Neighborhood Association for the North Central San Mateo. I currently serve as the president and um, and so I just keep my hands busy on all fronts, and especially with school, um, school related issues. And so what brings me here is really about my groundedness and, and identity as a value-centered person. I was drawn to San Mateo because of the values of diversity and inclusion. And I, there was no better place as a, as a bicultural person and a bicultural family to raise my kids in North Central. It was clearly home for me. And so what I bring to this process and, and what I love about San Mateo is a commitment to keeping San Mateo diverse. And, um, and I really feel like there's an opportunity to push an inclusion and an equity agenda in this process. And I hope to be a strong advocate and voice for those things to happen. And so those that I feel like this is what San Mateo represents and I want to see that legacy continue in the future. Can I sit or will that cause grief? I'm tired. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I do apologize. I was going to be late, but uh, it, uh, and it's tied to my 14 year old daughter at uh, rehearsal at San Mateo High School's uh, play. So I ask everybody to come out in October and see the Adams family uh, at San Mateo High School. It's part of our community. So there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm Cliff Robbins. I'm uh, currently chair of the uh, what used to be Public Works. It's now uh, Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission. I was a long time uh, Parks and Rec Commissioner. Uh, along with Alan here. And uh, I was also at one point president of the San Mateo Park Neighborhood Association. I'm a 20-year resident of San Mateo. I also serve on the board of Samaritan House. So those are all the things I, which is the largest, most impactful charity in the county, if you don't know about it. Uh, it that sort of uh, is my, my pedigree and what brings me to the table here. Uh, I love San Mateo's what I call dynamic diversity. We're a real city. So many of the uh, surrounding cities are bedroom communities. We, we are that, but we're also a dynamic downtown. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we have an active uh, business community, and the bottom line is that that makes for an exciting place to live, but it also brings up a lot of challenges. In my uh, day job, I'm a uh, corporate attorney, so I negotiate deals all the time. And uh, what I hope that allows me to bring to the table is a willingness and an openness to hear all diverse points of view, uh, not just my own, and uh, assimilate them and, uh, and help bring them uh, to fruition as part of this process. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Mallory, and I am here tonight um, as a member of the Planning Commission. I have served on the San Mateo uh, Park and Rec Commission for eight years. I was two years on the Public Works Commission and then came on to planning this summer. I was also four years on the San Mateo Foster City School Board. 
So I've been around for a while and have had the opportunity to get involved in a lot of different things for the city. What I love about San Mateo, there are a lot of things I love about San Mateo. I've lived here since 1993. And one of the things I love is where it is. I love being in the Bay Area. I love being close to the high tech area, to the culture of San Francisco, and being close to an airport. It's always a good thing. Um, I also love the history of this area and um, how the Ohlone Indians were settled here and then it was discovered by um, Portola and all of that, which is going to be a huge thing coming up with the History Museum, the San Mateo County History Museum. So I hope everyone will get involved with, with that. And I also love the diversity of, of our population and it makes living here always a new and exciting thing. So uh, what I wish San Mateo would do or could do is to get everybody involved in the process here of the general plan so that we get everybody's input and hear from all sides of the city, all the nooks and crannies. So it's nice to have everybody here tonight and I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Good evening, everybody. My name is Adam Lorraine. I am uh, a representative from the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission. It's a new commission, but before that we had Public Works and Sustainability Commissions in our fair city. So uh, for a year before that, I was a member of the Sustainability Commission. In addition to that, uh, I somewhat like Amaranth uh, was a part of County Civics 101, uh, the City Services Academy here in San Mateo, um, and I've definitely just grown up here being interested in how I can be a part of change here in our fair city. Um, in addition, I, yeah, I say I grow up here because I did. I've lived here for about 20 years, which is kind of cool for someone my age to be able to stand up and say, I've lived here for 20 years. Well, I have. Uh, my parents moved here in 1995. Um, so I've, I've really uh, gotten an opportunity to experience what it's like to grow up in a city with such a high quality of life. What, I, what do I love about San Mateo? Many other things have been said already. Um, I'm just going to echo them, but I, I love the location. We're in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco. My father got a job in San Mateo, and we moved here, and I didn't feel like I was far away. I didn't feel like I was in a suburb, really. It felt like a real city, as Cliff said. And um, so I, I think we have, in many ways, the, the best of both worlds and maybe all worlds. We have great weather um, and we're close to a lot of things, but we are still ourselves. And I think my being here is uh, an example of uh, an inclusive community that allows for people such as myself to get involved in the process. So I'm very happy to be here. I also think it's, anything is possible in this city. That's another thing I really love about San Mateo. We have, you know, we, we we have economic opportunities, and so, as, as Eric mentioned, when we have a, an opportunity like this, there's, there are resources, there is energy, uh, and, and we can really make a difference. So what, what I wish for San Mateo is, is gonna be somewhat similar to what Councilmember Rodriguez said. I want San Mateo to be a leader. There's an opportunity for that. We're a real city in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, we don't have to wait for San Francisco or San Jose or you know Burlingame for example to uh, take the lead on some of these issues that we know are pervasive throughout the Bay Area and in our own city. Uh, climate is changing. This is something that I want to see my city take a lead on. When we're talking about development we want to do it in an environmentally sustainable way. Um, I also yeah I think on the subject of leadership I, I just would like to see opportunities for more housing uh, in this city, as, as many people in this room know, um, we've had a lot more jobs come into this city and this region, a lot more cars, and a lot more people, and uh, it, it's time to discuss how we can see if we can find more housing in our city. So I'm looking forward to opportunities for that. And more aggressive and proactive work on improving bike and ped transportation in our city. Uh, it, I, they go right together along with everything else I just mentioned. So looking forward to being a part of that process. Um, good evening. My name is Ramiro Maldonado. I'm here representing the Planning Commission. I'm also part of the Civic Arts Committee as well. Um, I'm about 12 
13 year resident um, here in San Mateo, um, a 20 year resident of the Bay Area. Uh, my background is I've been working in nonprofit development uh, for large or small nonprofit for the past 20 years. Um, what, um, in addition to um, sitting on those two committees, I've also sat on the San Mateo County Commission on Disability and Aging uh, for the last um, eight years as well. Um, what I love about San Mateo, it's, I love its diversity. I love its how it's very family oriented. There's a lot of um, different activities that the city does that puts on that's very um, at Central Park and different locations that brings out the family. And, and that's something that's lacking here um, in the Bay Area, which um, one of the episodes is that is, is housing. So um, I look forward to having a dialogue and discussion where different groups can come out and find what their vision is of, um, for the city. Good evening, thank you all for being here. My name is Rick Bonilla, I am the mayor of San Mateo. And I'm gonna do a slightly different tack, tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm here tonight. So I am a person who started serving on city committees uh, and commissions back in 2001, when the phase of Bay Meadows that's being built now was being studied. And at that point it was 83 acres of, consisting of the Bay Meadows race track and the grandstand. The part that had the stables and the practice track had already been developed, uh, or it was in finishing stages of being developed. From there, I served on the Planning Commission, I served on the Public Works Commission. Finally, I became a City Council member back in 2015. Why did I do all of that? Because I care about our city. And I care not only as an individual, but I care as a person who is deeply invested, who grew up in San Bruno, looking at San Mateo and thinking that is a great city. When I was 18, I moved to San Mateo because I knew the quality of life was good here. Think about this. We have a growing population. The population here is now about 104, 105,000. Why? Because people know San Mateo has a great quality of life. People live here, they want to work here, and they want to live here. So we're attractive because we offer great services, and we're a wonderful place to live. Let me say something. When you think about the city, the city is not some separate other entity like a company or an organization. We, the people, are the city. Okay? The city is nothing without its people. The city is always looking for people to help. Okay? We need diversity of opinions, which is why I'm so happy to see all of you here tonight, because I know we're going to hear some diversity of opinions. And that's a great thing, because we're talking about important things. We're talking about going forward to the year 2040 in a, a safe, a healthy, and a prosperous way that allows us to be able to look at not only the things that we know we can expect to happen, but some things that are, are possibly beyond what we might even be able to imagine now, but we need to think about those things and plan for them. Because growing up and uh, uh, working in construction all my life, one thing I learned, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Okay, you have to have a plan. So we're gonna have a plan here. And I really uh, I encourage all of you to engage as well as you possibly can. Thank you all for being here. Knowing that the two public comment periods on the itemized agenda items tonight are about the subcommittee, subcommittee organization rules and procedures, and the second one is the key issues for the general plan to consider. Now is the time, apart from those two items, which I'm hoping kind of covers everything, um, for any public comment on any items not on the agenda that might be in the purview of this committee, which really would relate to the general plan and what's to be done with the general plan. Does anybody have any comment? Do we have any speaker cards? Not for this item. Okay, I'm pretty confident that these next, the next two agendized items are pretty open-ended, uh, open-ended enough that we can accommodate all speakers. Okay, hearing none. Okay, so here's, the, here's what we're gonna present to you and then break once for comment about the subcommittee and its role and what the subcommittee members are gonna do. And then we'll switch into the contents of the general plan, what the general plan is intended to do and, and how the update works. And this is just a quick uh, summary of the things we're gonna cover. General Plan 101, the project goals, how we're gonna schedule the, the meetings, public involvement we talked about, and then those final issues. Okay, next. Okay, so a lot of you may know this, so bear with us. Um, 
Every city and county in California, there's 415 cities and 49 counties, they're all required to have a general plan. The idea behind the general plan from the state is you can't know where you're going unless you have some blueprint or roadmap to get there, and it's also a way to measure your performance. In other words, are you building the housing that you might need? Are you putting um, incompatible uses not next to each other in ways that are safer for people? It's all about zoning is all about public health, safety, and welfare, and the general plan is all about how do we organize our city in such a way that we are increasing and improving quality of life for our residents and business owners and, and employees and other community members. So the general plan is, is basically consists of a map, a land use map or diagram that shows where things go, a circulation map or diagram that says how you get between places, which is important because technically this general plan update is really about updating those two elements. We'll get into that in a little while. Um, and they are, they are kind of the key of any city's general plan, land use and circulation. And every element of the general plan has goals, policies, and actions. A goal is the statement of an outcome or end state. We want to be better. Um, we want to be different, we want to be bigger, smaller, whatever that is. The policy is the city is going to take certain actions to get us to that goal and then the actions are enumerated and it, they can be public works is going to do this, planning is going to do that, police will do this, etc. So goal is the outcome overall end state, policy is the city is going to do this, action says what we're going to do, when and how, and who's responsible. Um, the general plan has to be internally consistent by state law in California. You can't have a statement in one place that says we're going to do, uh, we're going to paint all the curbs red in new subdivisions and another that says we're going to have green lanes for bikes in the same place. It's got to be one or the other or they've got to figure out a way to coexist. Um, the whole idea of a general plan is to look at conservation, change, growth and figure out how to balance them in a way that really reflects the community's vision. And this project and the process all starts with vision. Basically, we go from where we are today, kind of understanding the issues. Um, traffic is bad, housing is expensive. That's a pretty good start right there, right? Um, and how do we get from there to the place we want to be that you've heard all these committee members describe that they're already kind of starting to help frame a vision for the future. Um, and then, of course, in California, any large project, even a plan, is required to go through the California Environmental Equality Act to ensure that there any, any potential environmental impacts in a number of different subject areas can be mitigated or aren't going to happen. And so general plans usually have what's called an environmental impact report. And it's a little bit different than when you have like a development project that's a building or a site where the EIR is just about what happens there. This is all about citywide and what could happen citywide over the next 22 years to 2040. Um, Julie is going to talk for just a minute about our existing general plan and the update. So, um, hi everybody. Um, so just generally, uh, Charlie I mentioned your state requirements in terms of the information that's in the elements that are in the general plan. And so on this column you'll see the uh, six elements. So land use, circulation, housing, conservation, open space, parks and recreation, safety and noise. A lot of the land use policies or circulation policies have implications for other elements. And so, you know, while we hear housing is in, you know, community concern and circulation is a community concern, that also has implications to say, you know, safety and noise. And so just keep those in mind. The one other thing that's custom and very unique to San Mateo is actually our urban design element. And so San Mateo and the city is divided into 10 different planning areas. And within each of those planning areas, the idea is that you might have, you know, characteristic of that, of that planning area that's different from another planning area that's in the city. Um, lastly, um, if you look on the city's general plan, you'll note that the city's general plan was last updated in 2010. That's set a vision for 2030. Um, if anybody's interested in, in taking a look, there's a binder out in front with the entire uh, current general plan. Um, I can do so, yeah. So, so as established by the city council um, when this project was conceived, this particular t starting in 2018 general plan update, um, these are really the, the goals of the project. First of all, as I think has been, I'm, I'm sure it's intuitive to everyone, but it's really the goal of the city council and every one of the members of this committee to really broadly engage the community, not to miss folks just because they're busy and can't be here, or they're working and can't be here, or um, this is not a convenient way to participate. Um, and so. Um, we are going to go through a series of event, you know, pop-up events and um, in-person, you know, face-to-face -face meetings 
uh, community workshops that are focused on specific products in the process, um, including this visioning we're talking about. Um, there's also a mobile app that's, that's up and a website. I'll get you the address in a minute. But basically, we're trying to engage everybody the best way we can, whatever is, is working best for you to get involved. So um, the next step, of course, and the first major milestone in the process is to take a look at where we are today, where we want to be, and establish a vision for what San Mateo in 2040 is going to look like. And please feel free to take notes or take pictures, but this is all going to be available on the website, um, and it'll be easy for you to capture as a PDF um, and, and print if you like, or, or just keep it in, in digital form. So uh, a major underpinning of the general plan is to identify the major issues. Obviously, we know housing and transportation are major issues, but there are others. And there are other things that are very important to folks that might not be apparent to, to some of us that we need to hear. And so by really reaching broadly and deeply into the community, we are going to hear some things that we may not have been expecting that will be very important to folks. Um, and then, of course, knowing about it isn't, isn't enough. Let, what are we going to do about it? And one of the difficulties in a general plan is being realistic about what the city can accomplish, um, but being very fervent about when we do have a chance to, to do something. Maybe it's a regional problem like traffic. There are still things we can do that are focused on San Mateo and streets in San Mateo and circulation. So even if we have spillover traffic from the freeway, that doesn't mean we have to give up and just accept, accept it. The city has control over, uh, over our own territory. Um, and so, so the tools to implement the vision might be as simple as making physical changes to the environment like streets or protecting historic resources or improving parks or changing what's in a park to allow more and different uses. Um, but it might also be policy documents that the, the city council needs to consider that kind of change direction from where we've been going. And a lot of these things have, have been ongoing and are, are happening already. And I know a lot of you have been involved in sustainable streets, the rail corridor plan, which has led to transit-oriented development with transportation demand management features. So we actually have starting to see data where, where buildings are built and it's actually producing less traffic. Um, pretty, pretty difficult, counterintuitive thing, I think, for most people to handle. But um, we do have some data that's starting to show it's working. Um, clean water program, very important, right? Everything here runs into the bay. We don't want it to run in dirty. That's not good for any of us. Um, we have a pedestrian master plan, downtown plan that's, on, that's underway, a bicycle master plan that's, that's starting up, and then another climate action plan update, um, which uh, you know is really relevant for our team personally because we're involved in that too, and they dovetail very, very much. As, as a committee member Lorraine mentioned, you, know, you can't really think about planning for the future unless you start thinking about being more sustainable and, and climate action planning. So here's our project schedule. There is a, I, I like m much more fun, but detailed schedule here. You're welcome to look at. Uh, this is also online on the city's website. The thing I like about this one is you can look and see where we are today and see all of the different components of the project and what needs to be done. Um, it, may not be it may not be intuitive at first glance, so please ask one of us. Um, but basically, you can, look, you can look down the line and say, OK, maybe I should change my vacation next summer because I want to be at that meeting in August of 2019. Um, but here, here in a much simpler form are the steps we go through. So we are close to finishing uh, the base, what's usually called the baseline or existing conditions. In other words, understanding the problem really means looking at data. How many vehicle trips are coming down El Camino downtown, or, through downtown every day? What is the spillover from the, from the freeway? What's the air quality situation, et cetera? Um, and then we'll get into the visioning process in the next couple months. Then we will produce what are called alternatives. Some of you may have been through this process and, and even as recently as the, as the downtown plan. Basically, based on your community input, we start looking at what you've said about where things go and how they should change, and we start putting those out there. And a lot of times, you'll start with you know, A, B, and C, and what you'll get is a completely different D or E that says, take, take these ideas from here, match them with those. And so, for example, it's not all just spatial, like change should happen here, here, and here, but it should happen in certain ways, like uh, aging small retail centers maybe should be allowed to go up a story, or maybe they should be turned into parks. I'm just dog parks, you know, just all, all options are out there. I don't want to have any preconceived notions, but that's what the alternatives process is about. And then after that, you go into the policies. Um, a lot of the policy work is looking at the policies we have now, which are working, which clearly aren't working, um, which ones might change and how. You'll be a big part of that. And then by the winter of 2020, we got your draft general plan and environmental impact report. And that basically kicks off a whole series of public meetings that take a look at did we, did we get the community's vision right? Are the policy changes what the community wanted? If not, how does that, how does that work? And we'll be back to this committee 
Um, we've planned seven more meetings that run all the way through um, December of 2019. So this committee and this format will be one of the ways that we inform that process intermittently and repeatedly and uh, in, a, in a planned way that goes with each one of these documents and their drafts. What did I miss? Title, uh, typo. typo? It's supposed to be winter 2019. Twin winter 2019. Right. The, that's right. Because the end date, the end date for um, having all of the general plan process and documents done is summer of 2020. So correct. These should be this should all be 2019. Our first mistake. Um, so here are the upcoming meetings. On October 16th, we're going to have the second meeting of the subcommittee, which is at the... Remind me. Um, general plan subcommittee. So that's going to be at the Garden Center in Beresford. Okay, so it's just a, two, two block, a block and a half away. Um, and then October 25th, we're having a youth workshop. One of the really cool things about that, if you've ever seen these, is you get some very different ideas. Um, youth are not as constrained in some of the ways we've become accustomed to. Um, and, and actually, um, uh, I recently, I'm finishing up a similar project in Stockton, and one of the big eye-openers was we had a, a youth workshop, and it was more for college age. We had it at Delta College, you know, the, the community college. A lot, of, a lot of people, like 400 and something people in the room. And actually, some of the students were some of the most conservative, don't change anything we like it this way that I've, I had heard in the whole process. So you never, you never know what you're going to hear from younger folks. Um, November 3rd, we're going to have our first, uh, first workshop. And it's going to be an interactive workshop with activi you know, table activities. Um, uh, not so much talking at you and listening, but you listen to each other and inform each other. And that'll start to get at what are the most important things in San Mateo. And if you look at the website, I'm still prompting the website because I haven't shown you the, the, the URL yet. You can already do some of this stuff online. You can already go online and start to fill in some of the blanks and move things around and say, I want this over this. It also works great on the phone. Um, then December 13th, we'll have our third meeting of the subcommittee, which basically will be to make comments to the Planning Commission and City Council about the vision statement for, for the project that will then um, lead to the goals and policies. And then we're, we're trying to get a regularized schedule in 2019 and 20 for this group, so you'll always know it's fourth Wednesday of the month. We weren't able to do that for the end of 2018, but we're going to try to get on a regular schedule so you can block it out if you need to in advance. Next slide. So I mentioned we got the youth workshop. We, got, we have um, the community workshops. Um, something we've just done two other places. This is Menlo Park. We also did it in Stockton was uh, rent a double-decker bus because it's kind of fun to begin with. But actually what happens on the bus is you see the world in a completely different way. You see the geometry of the streets and you see how things are working or not working. And it's, it's the kind of thing where you don't even know what you're going to get until you, you see it. And, um, uh, but it really leads to a, a very robust and meaningful discussion about what should change or not. Um, you also have to duck for power lines once in a while, so just warn you in advance. Actually, we try to set up the route so that doesn't happen. But the bus, tour, the bus tour will take us through different areas of town, and you might see things in a different way than you have seen before, but it really kind of focuses on, is this an area, you know, you can see change happening with big buildings around, say, Hayward Park Station, and you might look at an area where we have industrial next to residential, and it's like, is this a place that should change, or is this a kind of a nice piece that we like of our history? You see it in a different way, and it, and it really kind of speeds up the conversation. We'll have, we'll have an open house um, later on in the process where you can come and look at the products from the general plan and just kind of speak freely one subject at a time and, 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 and impart some influence on the process. Um, we, like I mentioned before, we'll have pop-up pop neighborhood events. One of the best ways to, to, to catch people is go where they're going to be already and politely ask, can we also ask you about what's going on in your neighborhood in the city? Um, online engagement exercises have already started. Uh, we'll have e-blasts and other social media ways to participate, these meetings, and of course the more traditional City Council and Planning Commission meetings and hearings. So here it is, strivesanmateo.org, um, and feel free to mess around with this um, here at home, on the mobile, on the larger screen. It is optimized for, for any of those, so you'll see on the mobile it's, you don't get quite as much graphic, but you get the buttons that tell you what to do, and it basically talks about the same four components we've been talking about, visioning, then the plan, policies, goals, and objectives. Um, we also have a link to the downtown plan because we have some overlapping timing on what's going on with the downtown plan and the downtown plan um, strategy and results so far are meant to inform the general plan. There may be some things that are relevant citywide and maybe some other things that the general plan might tell us we should change from the downtown plan process. Um, 
Anyway, feel free to look around, send us comments if you're not finding things easily or you have ideas. Pardon? Oh, oh yeah. And so we just launched this last Wednesday and we've already had more than 150 people look at it without any major announcements. 10 people have used the online exercise. Um, and here, here's the portal into the online exercise. You can upload photos. You can add to the word wall. Um, you can describe your vision now. You can, um, in the vision process, there's about 20, 15 or 20 statements. You can move them up and down, add to them. Um, things about parks and, and uh, you know, the rate of change and quality of life issues. Um, you're free to give us more information about yourself. And um, you're also, this is also important. You can see what other people have done and see if you agree or disagree or how you might react to others' opinions. And then, uh, sign up. Oh, and, yep, and then we have a sign up for the mailing list. So it's a pretty easy one step to get in and then go where you like to go. Um, and, and you can come back as many times as you like and let us know what you think. Um, we mentioned going out to specialty locations, making sure we engage people, um, not to make them uncomfortable. So we'll check in advance, but, but really, I, I, I find one of the most creative and, and engaging parts of these processes is where you just go to an event where people aren't necessarily planning to talk about planning and you actually get some really um, cogent and candid uh, feedback. Okay, as long as you're here. Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you about the pothole that's in the street. But after that, you get the, you, I mean, you really get like, the, here's what I would do to change the community and make it better. Um, I think we covered most of this. Um, so. This, this committee is not just the people you see here. All of these people know, and you all know, tons of people in the community, um, many of whom may share your opinions, many of whom may agree somewhat or may disagree. But these folks and you are our ambassadors on this project. The more you can do to get more people involved, the more diversity of opinions, the more different kinds of folks from different geographic areas of the city, people who work in the city and are interested in making that commute easier, people who live in the city and work elsewhere, everyone is welcome. Um, and the role of the general plan subcommittee and our role collectively is to get those folks involved. We said eight meetings over the next two years, two hours per meeting, I think we're on track. All the meetings are open to the public, all the materials are available online, um, and there will be meeting summaries after the meetings. Um, there's always public comment, multiple public comment, and we've said this a number of times, but it's recorded, so um, you can just fast forward through this part where I'm talking, 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 and get to the uh, committee member comments. Um, in the future. So the next item is, ba is for, the <coughs> excuse me, for the committee to elect a chair and vice chair. So the role of the vice chair and chair, as in any committee or commission or board, is to guide the meeting, guide the group, make sure everyone gets a chance to participate, um, stick, help us stick to the agenda, and ensure public comment, and um, kind of organize and shepherd the subcommittee discussions. So. Um, do, you want to, do we want to do that now or you want to do that after Brown Act? Okay. All right, so, so right before we go to public comment on this section, we're going to ask for nominations from the committee members and the election of a chair and vice chair. So um, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the Brown Act. This is basically California's open government or sunshine law that says if you have a meeting like this, it's got to be conducted in public. These people can't be emailing themselves after the meeting. Oh, can you believe that, what that person said? Um, and staff is a big part of making sure that, that if there's information that comes from the community, it goes to everybody, not just one person or not one at a time. These folks are pretty seasoned. They're all on existing um, boards or commissions at the city. So this is more just a reminder to ourselves that these are official Brown Act meetings just like uh, city boards and commissions. Um, they all have meeting notices and agenda published in advance so you'll know what the subject matter is. Um, and I think that's it. Okay, why don't, so why don't we take public comment on the subcommittee's role, organization, the project procedures and schedule, and then we'll ask the committee members to elect a chair and vice chair. Do we have any comment cards for this item? All right, so I'm Mike Nash. I am part of the Baywood Owners Improvement Association, and I'm also an executive on the San Mateo United Homeowners Association. So I'm hoping in that, those roles to involve a great many of San Mateans in this process, because I think it's vitally important that a city that's as diverse, which is a quality that many of the subcommittees people mentioned is important, um, you're going to find a diversity of opinion 
and I happen to feel that there are certain things that are essential to collecting that diversity of opinion and then making sense out of it all. So, you know, planners know what they're doing. I have great respect for the profession. I can tell you about that privately later, but, you know, I'm in, I do think that this is a good effort. So. Um, I've been reading the document that was included in the approval of PlaceWorks, and it's entitled The Scope of Services, Update to the Scope of Services. And I'm assuming that that document has not been changed subsequently, and that's essentially the Bible on how are you going about doing this. So that's good. And if it does change, I would hope that those changes are, are you know, um, made public very, very rapidly. Because uh, I think that's important, and there are good and bad things in here that um, I feel need to be addressed. Um, the vision process, for example, you've said you're going to have one workshop in two places, and then a youth workshop, and then you're going to write a vision. Is that is that accurate? We're going to. Um, are you okay? Are keeping them on the two minutes? Because maybe you should go through first, and I can answer all your questions. All right, sure. So my concern would be that that seems. For a city that has the diversity that we um, see, I don't know if that's enough. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in consumer research, if properly done, we you do scientifically drawn samples that you can project into whatever groups you feel are important to understand um, if you do it right. And I see survey, and I'm pleased to see a survey that's actually asking for demographics, because I find if you don't ask demographics, you don't know what to do with the answers. But I don't know what you're going to do with that. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about what the intention of that is, and if you're attempting to get to a point where you can actually make statements about the broad diversity of sub-segments that exist in the San Mateo process. So those are the three things that I'm concerned about. Just Thank you, Mike. You're um, welcome. Committee, would you like me to answer questions one at a time? You want me to hold it until all speakers have gone? It's your pleasure. Yeah, just need notes and respond afterward yeah. as we can do best. Okay. okay. Next, we have Maxie Good evening. I welcome this opportunity and with the expectation that it will be a full, fair, and respectful process. And that's what we say we're starting with, so I'm looking forward to that. But unlike the previous downtown plan process, which I also participated in, which seemed more like a marketing plan for decisions that had already been made by stakeholders, excluding the residents. I admit I am cynical, and you can all shake your head <laughs> that you acknowledge that, because I've participated in many planning efforts, focus groups, surveys, project meetings over my years living in San Mateo, and decision makers have consistently heard the same things from the residents about what they value about living in San Mateo. I don't expect it's going to be much different. But with each uptick in the economic cycle, and the latest one is a doozy, property owners and developers see opportunities to make changes to long-standing community plans that they feel inhibit their ability to make more money, which is their right to feel that way. But it doesn't mean that existing residents don't also have the right to ensure that their community values and quality of life are also protected. And we're looking to you all, and I know many of you, to make sure that all the sides in this important update are debated openly. And therefore, I question whether limiting public input to two minutes is the best way to hear from the community. It prevents dialogue and give and take, and the ability to add or correct information that comes later. Many of you have been on this side of a panel like you, and you know how frustrating it is to come before the mic, spill your guts, and then have nothing talked back as if anybody even heard what you said. 
So I really urge you to maintain trust and credibility with all of us, that as you hear things, that you actually take up the issues you've heard and talk about it, debate about that. And if you're going to be responding immediately, that would be wonderful. But hopefully there'll be an opportunity if people who have presented information think that something's being misrepresented, there's an ability to correct. So the dialogue is important, and I look forward to the process. Good evening. I have a question. Um, I represent an organization that's focused on inclusion of families with children and adults with developmental and physical disabilities in the community. Um, so the reason I'm here tonight is to see what opportunities there will be to be intentional about including those folks in the process and what sensitivity there'll be in the final plan to actually addressing the goal of inclusion of people with all types of disabilities who have a lot to contribute to the community, but we need to be intentional in thinking about how we include them in the process. Um, so my question is, just as you're having some special targeted approach to engage youth, um, do you have some creative ideas for how to bring people with different types of abilities and disabilities into the process? Thank you. So Mike asked basically two questions. One is, is the visioning process at the beginning enough? And the answer is it's never enough, right? I mean, we could do visioning for years, but I think, I think if we're efficient um, and the committee agrees and we are able in a couple meetings to capture the sense of what we hear in person, there will be so much available online and we've received through as simple as uh, the emails and letters, we will actually have a pretty big breadth of information. So. The answer to your question is we certainly could do more. Um, 
um, like any project, the project has a budget. You know, you've, I, th I, I appreciate and thank you for reading through the scope of work. And so if, if the committee um, has an idea and the city council wants to you know, move things around or make things more available or different, yes, you are correct. We would go through a process that would be completely transparent and public and we'd say we would change that. So for now, that's the process we have. My one reassurance to you is I've done it, we've done it this way before and we've had really good results. So um, that's not to say that we wouldn't get more if we ask for more and more times, but we, it can be very efficient. And, and there's actually a benefit in some ways of telling folks, okay, we've had all this information so far online. Here are the results from it. We're going to do this in-person meeting. We're going to do these pop-up events. We're going to do the youth event. Here's what we heard from that. Bring it back to this group and say, okay, here's where we think we are. As soon as someone says, well, I think we missed this from somebody else and we missed that, that automatically comes into the process. So usually when people are at their most critical and say, you haven't heard from folks with, with disabilities or you haven't heard from seniors, you know, usually we also get the comment that we haven't heard and we're able to combine it. But I guarantee you in this process, we can always do more, we can always do better. Um, but I think what will hap what, the way it'll play out is we will have those opportunities. And then if there's something egregious or clearly missing, we have, the, we have the opportunity to adjust and change later phases of the process to put more energy into the earlier phase. The other question, Mr. Nash, I think you asked is, what do you do with demographic data? So now this is a tough one because increasingly in this country, there are more and more people who will not participate the more we ask them to t identify themselves. And it's a, hu it's a huge issue. And um, what we're trying to do is find a balance where if you go back to the website, can you go back to the website slide? I should have a little pointer, but there. So you, you, you're, you can sign up, most people will, right? So most people will sign up, they will use the website once, they won't answer the same questions twice, they'll play by all of the implicit and explicit rules, and we'll know where they live, they'll identify where they live. So we'll have a lot of good data that's, that's self-provided. Um, there will definitely be people that we will only catch by going to them where they are already, who won't want to leave their name, they won't want to give any demographic information, and we'll try to gather that the best we can. We can just ask people, you know, we're not going to put your name next to this comment, but do you live in North Central? Do you live in Bay Meadows? Where, you know, or do you work downtown? What's the genesis of your interest in this particular item? So um, we're, we're intentionally going to try to make people as comfortable as possible, and so it won't be as scientific as it would be if everybody had to sign up verify their IP address, you know, do some kind of login, um, but we will get more and probably better information qualitatively, and we'll just report where we have the data that's tied demographically because that's how we got it, or where we have someone who said, I live in this part of town and that's all, that's all we know. So we'll be very honest about where the data came from and never try to represent that it's all on the same level of demographic uh, intensity. Um, then Jen, you had a question, Stokely, about how do we include folks who might not normally be the folks who are most able to participate? So obviously we've talked about the youth workshop and going out to folks, but we also have a big part of this effort that's working with agency partners throughout the city and, and, and uh, nonprofits and non-governmental organizations, and we're open to any ideas that'll get more people there. Um, as far as I know, everything we're gonna do is gonna be accessible um, to folks uh, with, you know, with ADA accessibility, um, and we're happy to explore new ways to get folks out um, you know, the city may have resources like a van if we need it, um, but uh, the, the main intent has been to let the folks who are most professional about getting people with diverse interests help organize those folks to get them to the venues that we're using. If we need to go out and create different venues in particular to catch people, then we will do that. Okay, um, I think that boom's catching. So I can speak for that too. We're open to piggybacking onto other, you know, community events, or, or if you have an organization that's interested in inviting us out, we're happy to come out and sort of, you know, we can do like a mini uh, workshop, you know, for that specific group. So we're happy to do that. Um, you guys are a lot more connected to different community groups than you know staff maybe, and so definitely grab my card, you know, uh, let me know, and then we can talk offline. And, and one, one other option, because uh, Mr. Nash really kind of hit this, I mean, 
th this, this is a project that has a schedule and a budget and all that, but one of the things that we can do and we've done before is if you have energy among a local nonprofit or a non-governmental organization and you want to go do something, we can give you the materials that we've prepared for these other phases of the process and give you a package that you can use and you know, hold your own meeting, get your own input and report it in that way. So again, that might go into, it might, might not have all the same demographic checkpoints that others do, but we'll know, you know, we'll know that where it came from. So any, any level that anybody wants to participate, we will find a way to accommodate and get your input into this process. I think we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you folks, would you like to nominate and elect chairs and vice chairs? Uh, I'll make a nomination for chair, and I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner uh, Mallory to be chair. We have a nomination for Commissioner Mallory for chair. Are there any other nominations for chair? I'll second that. Okay. Now we have a nomination for <laughs> chair. Sorry. I actually work in one city where they don't do seconds, so I kind of, it's kind of, okay, so we have a nomination and a second for Commissioner Mallory for chair. Do we have any other nominations for chair? Okay, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, Chair Mallory, would you want to direct us to a, a nomination and election for the vice chair? Is there a nomination for vice chair? I would nominate Adam Murray. Is there a second? Is there any other nominations? All those in favor of Adam Murray as vice chair, please raise your hand. And those opposed? No. All right. That's official. Okay. Next slide. Yep. Okay, Chair Mallory and Vice Chair Lorraine and committee members. Um, this section is basically um, a lead-in to start promoting um, conversation and comment from our community about the issues we face today in San Mateo. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, current projects uh, that are in <coughs> development and are coming through the pipeline. That is things that are already things we know about or may have approvals. Um, transportation and circulation issues we're all aware of. Um, and then housing availability and affordability. These really um, are these salient big issues. They have many spin-off tentacles into all kinds of quality of life issues, but I think if you had to categorize everything that we're most concerned about that we see happening around us, this would be a pretty good uh, uh, way to characterize them. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit about existing and projected population. Um, uh, we do have about 104, 105,000 people, and guess what? We're growing. So right now, the Depa California Department of Finance, the Association of Barrier Governments, uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission are looking at a significant amount of growth between now and 2040. And so during the period of this plan, 22 years, that's, that's 27,000 more people. Um, and um, as was mentioned, um, we're, building the, we're building the jobs and we're not keeping up with the housing. And it's not just happening here, it's happening throughout the Bay Area and really throughout California. Um, next slide, please. And so here's what that looks like in graphic form. Um, tw by 2040, the, in the county, we're talking about more than 75,000 new jobs, 1.3 million new jobs in the Bay Area. That's a lot. And these are just projections. Things could change. But I think we're all aware. We've all we all lived through the recession, and it, it, it was a big hit. And it was a big hit for a few years, and then we just went right back up. So um, even if there are some ups and downs in the cycle, that's generally thought to be what the trend will look like. Next slide, please. This is, I think, this is one of the most, tell oh, um, did you have a question? Yeah, it was about the previous slide. Oh, go ahead. So there's the Caltrans and the A5 lines underneath. Yeah. Why is there such a discrepancy between those two lines and the A5 lines? Well, you know, my, my guess, so it's like, you guys ever, did you watch the coverage of the hurricane, you know, and they do it on our, our local news and they show you the model and one model goes like that and another model goes like this and then you see what happens. The computer models are basically data input driven. And so the way the models are organized says, if we've had something happening in the past as a trend, what's it going to do in the future? So Caltrans is looking at cars. How many cars do we have? Where are they going? What's the volume on the freeway? And so they come out with a straighter line projection that says, we're well, just kind of increasing in it. It's, we expect it to increase kind of dramatically a little more and then level out. ABAG looks at where 
housing and jobs are distributed specifically under what are called priority development areas, PDAs. Everybody heard of that? So the ideal from some planners' perspective is that every city behaves like a small town. It's got a main street with a downtown. We're fortunate to be a big city with a small town feel in our, and a, a good one in our main street and downtown. But part of, the, part of what you see here happens is there's been a lot of effort over the next year, you know, the next decade or so to 2030 to try to, by ABAG and MTC, to try to push growth into those priority development areas. And so that tends to kind of stabilize things. As you get further and further out, that's less apparent. And I think there are probably a lot of reasons for this change, but I think one of them is more work has been done in the near term to try to see growth happen in places where infrastructure already exists. Um, I wouldn't trust any of these numbers. It's just, they're just indications that most people, most economists, most experts expect the growth to continue even if there are some downturns. Yeah. I don't know, and let, if it's okay with you guys, let me save that question to think about. So I, I'll run through and then we'll try to do what we did before for the benefit of the committee and answer all the questions at once. So there's a question about the woods and pool line. Okay, next slide. So this one, this tells you something you already know and you do not want to admit, which is rush hour is starting to take over the entire day. This is a really, really telling and significant graphic. Could, go back. So not that long ago, even five or 10 years ago, there used to be a pretty big dip here where if we all know if we went out at 11.30, like if I want to go drive to Burlingame for lunch or you know, go to the city for a day, day game or whatever, it's not that bad, right? Well, now it is that bad. And, and this is real data from this year from Caltrans. This is northbound on 101 out here at 92. It's the same in the other direction. This one's maybe a little bit more prominent in the peak. But what it says is if you want to get somewhere really quickly and easily on the freeway, go before 5 in the morning. And if you go at noon, you might get there or it might be just as bad. And so... This is new and, and this is different. And one of the things it tells you too is just a five or 10% difference in traffic makes a difference. So you guys have experienced this. If you're, if you're on 101, go north past the airport and you're here, you know, you might not be able to go the speed limit or over the speed limit, but it's not stop and go. But very quickly, you know, in an hour or two from two to four in the afternoon, that changes drastically. And we've all seen this with, you know, our map navigation systems or even just observing, like something happened. And I know there's, I know you guys know the community well enough. You can see the traffic spilling into city streets and go, oh, I know where the accident is. It's, it's either there on 92 at Alameda or it's on 101, you know, or it's in Foster City. You, you, we all have this intuitive sense now just based on how we feel traffic. And this goes back to my comment before that, Yes, it's a regional and bigger problem, but some of, some of it is not insoluble. There are things we can do in the city to, to make that better. But I want this to, to sit with you for a minute because what this really says is all of the things we've done that we think are really cool, like telecommuting and changing our work schedules or whatever, in some ways, they don't actually help this. In fact, if everyone's working off hours, this could get even flatter. Um, however, telecommuting and working off hours still makes the peak less bad, right? So these two, what were the two traditional peaks are still benefited by the fact that some people aren't traveling at those times. It would be even worse. But it's just kind of a wake-up call that, you know, the, we're, we're getting away in California from level of service, A, B, C, D, F, for how good an intersection operates or how good a ro roadway operates. But one of the things that was really easy to talk about was level of service a for the economy is level of service F for traffic. And that's what we're facing. We have an incredibly robust economy. People are willing to drive huge amounts and distances from where they live, where they can afford to live, to come to work at higher paying jobs. And that's what the general plan is all about, is how do we resolve that? How do we create opportunities to do things closer together, live, work, play in the same places, good transportation systems that don't require a single occupant vehicle trip to get there. That's what it's going to take to get this back to some semblance of there really are two peak periods, morning and afternoon. And so what do we get? Congestions on, congestion not just on the freeway, but on city streets. Um, I mentioned the mobile apps. I haven't worked in a city in the last seven or eight years where people say, can we do something about that? Um, general, general plans usually don't tell Google and, and others what to do. Um, it's always worth trying. But I think I think San Mateo is in a, in a uniquely tough situation because we are the hub of the peninsula. Um, it's not just that we're recognized as the, you know, the major city in San Mateo County, even though there's one up north that's slightly larger. Um, but 
uh, I think the issue of, of 92 is, 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 is unique. And so the Dumbarton Bridge has its own issues, the other end of the San Mateo Bridge. But for example, um, I live and work in East Bay, and coming over here at 434, 45, you know, we get to about Foster City and we look at the traffic and we're like, well, <laughs> we're not going back the other direction for three or four hours. So, um, you know, you just, you just really can't. And you have to sympathize with the people that are really stuck in the traffic every day. And so what can we do as a regional partner and a leader, as committee members mentioned, to start dealing with how traffic affects our community in ways that will then positively affect the regional traffic situation? Um, and there are solutions. Next slide, please. Okay, that gets us to affordability. Again, I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just starting to help paint a picture of you know, where, where we might start attacking these problems. Um, so what this graph basically shows is that this, the city is, is, has relatively high home prices, and they have been growing more or less faster than the averages around us. Um, and I think it's just as the, all the committee members mentioned, and you know it's just a wonderful place to be. So why wouldn't you if you could afford it? And of course, for a lot of us, we could afford it some time ago, and we're just kind of hanging in there. <coughs> and, we're, you know, and this is, this is why when you see the buy, or buy versus build equation in a city like San Mateo, so many houses are getting bigger, occupying more of the lot, changing the design, because you, you don't really have the option of like selling your house and buying in the same market. You're just, it's just too expensive. Go ahead. And rents aren't cheap either. Um, and San Mateo is right up there at the top of some of the, some of the most expensive rents in the Bay Area. And I think what we figured out is <coughs> a family of four with two wage earners can reasonably afford about half of a house. Um, in other words, the median home price is about 1.4 million and two people earning the average income, which is pretty high in San Mateo, can afford a $700,000 house. So anybody who's buying anything new and, and making a decent salary but a kind of a median salary is really stretching their budget to be able to pay for housing. There's a general rule in economics you shouldn't spend more than 30% of your income and some people are spending 50 or 60% of their household income just to, just to be able to live here, both rent and ownership. Okay, so that concludes our fun fest of facts that are all very uplifting and um, positive, but I, I do want to leave you with the whole reason we're here <coughs> is to start talking about how we can address some of these problems using the general plan as a tool for solutions. So, or do you want to? I think I think we were going to go subcommittee questions first, um, and then I will once we get more comment and questions from the from the community, I can answer those. Are there any subcommittee questions on the? information that was just presented. A good outreach strategy involves, you know, multi-prong, you know, go to people where they are, um, multilingual, accessible, mobile, you know, all of those things. Um, I, I wonder if there are opportunities to go even further, and, um, and some of the ideas that came up for me was, are there ways that we can leverage existing known contacts through our, our databases? Like, for example, Parks and Rec, which I am so honored to serve on the, on the Commission of Parks and Rec, and I totally forgot to mention that in my intro. Um, there is um, there is a, a robust database of people that are enrolled in classes and activities that are not usually attending these meetings. There are young families. There are um, there's and subsidized programming. Uh, and I, I, there are seniors coming to meal plans and programs. There's the whole entire school district, um, including the high school and the elementary. I, I, just, I just don't want to miss out on, um, on connecting the, the dots and bridging those gaps in terms of leveraging the contacts and data that we already have as a city and making sure that they are, are part of this process. So my question is, is that feasible? Yay! <laughs> the second question about outreach, um, maybe not so much outreach, but about making this process meaningful, I really did respond to, um, to the comment about the need for dialogue. A lot of the, the ways that this process has been outlined is very um, one directional, <laughs> uh, where we're collecting input in a very you know, 
constrained format or you know somewhat constrained format online and um, and I think that there there is an opportunity to think about other types of formats perhaps like a forum type of format where we could bring people together um, with differing perspectives representing different uh, demographics different populations different interest groups and um, and have opposing sides and views in conversation with each other in a mediated form. I think that that, has, that process is long overdue in, in this city because there has been a lot of division around, um, around height and density. And, um, and I think that it would be remiss to think about ways that we can promote dialogue in this process and do it in a way that's transparent and inclusive. Is that possible? <laughs> We can look into that. Uh, one thing that we have been talking to is PC, you know, it's conflict resolution mm -hmm. about sort of doing meeting facilitation. Great. Um, so that is something, we're thinking the same ideas, but you're you provided um, additional suggestions, so thank you. Great. Two for two. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. The, the last question I have is about data. So I, I'm a data nut. And, um, and for me, they're moving forward. I, I feel like a lot of the data that was presented um, needs to be contextualized. And, and so I would really like to see us go much further in the presentation of data. Um, and, and like, you know, little things like, you know, citing the sources should be standard, but, but also I think contextualizing um, different aspects of things like, you know, we know that there are benchmarks like, you know, RENA goals and, you know, things like that, that I think are really important. Um, and I, and so I don't, I mean, this is, we can get, we can get further in the weeds, but, but I am, I have to say that I'm a little bit concerned about the timeline in terms of framing the issues. Um, and making data real and um, and understood commonly across this entire stakeholder base, so that we're not. Um, I think that that's work that lays the foundation for a healthy conversation and healthy process. And so I just want to see us get you know take a, a bigger leap in terms of where how we present data, um, how we frame that data, what what context we're providing um, in, in that presentation, long view, short view, projections. And so I, I really hope that this can be a real, um, like a no holds bar, like give it to them, we know you can handle it, data process. Is that possible? Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me just get up and speak. I think um, this meeting initially, because we're, we were uh, setting up a new committee, and there's uh, some housekeeping organization stuff that we really wanted to focus on. So the briefing book that's included with the agenda is very high level. Yes. What you're asking in terms of delving into the details, um, we are working, you know, uh, Place works and Charlie and Carrie and the team are working on existing conditions report mm -hmm. that will be uh, coming before the next meeting and that will delve into much more detail. And so right now for this meeting, because the focus is on housekeeping items, um, and we're introducing the topic of the general plan. So you know for this first meeting where we kept it at much more high level, mm -hmm. but for the next one. Right, and, and and so I guess because we don't know what's going to be presented at the next one until you know the Friday before. Um, I I wonder. Is there, is there an opportunity for us um, as subcommittee members or you know the community at large to even to say I, I'd like to better understand this can we actually present you know this other data source or you know I ask questions about the things that are presented I guess I just want to make sure that we're um, we're not just wholesale um, that there's that there's input into the the, the information the the breadth of information that's provided so that that's up for a discussion also because I think that that matters in terms of the long term sure so I, I think um, one way we could handle that is the existing condition and you guys have been through this in other projects the existing condition reports are not only important to set the baseline um, for where we are today 
but they're also set the baseline for the environmental review process, right? So they become the setting sections in the environmental document, which in this case is an environmental impact report. So they're really important because it's not just about a shared common understanding we can talk from, but this is the data. So this was our existing condition as of such and such date in 2018. Now, when we change our plan and it does different things, how do we compare those? Because you don't, even though everyone wants to know what would this plan do and what would the next plan do, and we can talk about that, what CEQA, the California Environmental Equality Act, wants is what's on the ground right now and what could this plan do? So we're, before your next meeting and with the mayor's guidance, probably further in advance than not, um, you, will, you will receive these pretty voluminous, so it's not you know, nice graphics on a few slides. It's hundreds and hundreds of eight and a half by 11 pages with data and graphs and tables. And you'll have a chance to look through that. And then at the meeting, we'll be talking about, okay, what did we learn from this? So you will have an opportunity and the community will have an opportunity to comment and say, I looked at this data on whatever, whatever the subject is, and I want to know more about this, where'd this come from, or did you consider this alternative source? So we will have an opportunity to parse that much more finely um, with that in front of you, and we'll get that to you in advance. Yeah, question. But uh, mostly to, uh, to echo what Amo said, but with a twist or two, I think the outreach is key, and we, we have to do better, and we do a great job at this city, actually. But looking out at this audience, I see a number of community activists who I know and mostly love, uh, but they are, um, you know, a couple particularly, uh, the, but they're recidivists. You know, it's the, they're the ones who come back all the time, and God bless them, uh, but that also their voices get heard and the people up at this panel ha suffer from that same we're all active we're all involved and and god bless all of us for doing it but uh it would be wonderful to try and pry some input uh from folks who keep their head down and just live and have to put up with the traffic the parks and the, the housing costs uh, on the uh uh, on the dialogue part, that's where I'm going to differ just a little bit because I'm a big believer in process and, uh, and I think we have to be very careful to get everybody heard. Uh, you know, we do have to do some limits, whether it's two minutes or three minutes, or this will just go on forever and ever. Uh, but I do think maybe, and it might already be in the schedule, sort of the study group concept where uh, commissions and the council uh, do them and you can be a lot more free form and you can have public ask questions of staff and answer and you don't have to be quite so uh, so rigid uh, could work and I think it would help I'll be quiet now thank you madam chair sure okay Okay, I have at least one sort of process question to, to go along with the theme here, and then I may have at least one question about the briefing's work and, and what we just started talking about related to data. So my, my process question is, is somewhat related to what has been echoed already by a couple of committee members uh, about the concern of making sure we get uh, the input we need and and the time to to discuss and chew on this a bit. I'm, I'm a, I'm a little surprised at the notion of having these meetings end at about 8 p.m. And so I guess I just want to throw it out there maybe to the committee or, or perhaps get a, a, a feeling from staff on on the whether there is flexibility there because I'm, I'm thinking to a public comment already this today uh, concerned about two minutes per person, for example. And indeed, if we had 30, 40 people give a two minute comment, will there be any time left to even talk about what we were supposed to talk about? So is, is, is there flexibility in that? And I'll stand next so to you using my mic. For this room particularly, we're, um, we get kicked out at a certain time. <laughs> so some of the city facilities, um, and even if we rent facilities off site, I think there's some time limits. Um, Certainly, you know, coming to a meeting is one way to provide public input, but a lot of times, even if you don't get a chance, you know, say we have, you know, somebody who, want, who comes to a meeting but doesn't get a chance to speak, or, you know, they uh, spoke for two minutes but have more to add, um, you can certainly send us an email, write a letter, you know, come to City Hall and talk to us in person, you know, give, give me a phone call. There's other ways to provide input. And this is a you know, multi-year effort. It's not like you come to one meeting and that's the only chance you. So I, I would encourage everybody to come and participate. You know, if you can't make the meeting, watch the videos. Um, but if you don't think two minutes is enough, you know, send us your written comments. You, you can elaborate much more in detail. 
Um, if there are certain questions, and we have, can, we can do FAQs and respond to those in, in group or in mass. Okay, thank you. I suppose I'll, I'll try to rip a comment off of that in that. I, I think um, I'm, I'm even concerned about, just we just spoke about, uh, Charlie just mentioned, you know, getting hit with voluminous data. And so while I appreciate the, even the opportunity for those who may not be able to make a public comment um, or a lengthy enough one at one of these meetings um, can have other avenues of, of providing contribution, uh, I think I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about how we're, as a, we as a committee are gonna be able to chew everything and then have a meaningful discussion about maybe the most key points of every one thing in this eight meeting, two hour meeting structure. Um, but I guess we'll see how it plays out. So I, I imagine I'll, we'll, we'll see how the next meeting goes and I will uh, maybe have more questions if, if it doesn't seem to be working out. But I have maybe at least one question about the briefing book. I also ask questions, by the way. So that's the thing, I'm, I'm going to be asking at least one question about everything we talk about, and I hope I have enough time to do that in our two-hour format, and I intend to, as, as the chair allows. Um, one question about the, uh, that was in the briefing book, relates to the major development project slide, um, and there were some totals given, uh, and, and one of the narratives in that one discussed um, sort of everything in the pipeline for uh, housing units as well as retail and commercial. So it was kind of, I, I was interested in the context of what the city of San Mateo has. Uh, I guess to Amo's point, um, you know, how, how do the totals of the retail and the office space gains that we are have in the pipeline um, compare with the current San Mateo stock? I think through the briefing book, I was able to get a sense of where we were on housing because I, I saw a number, some 40, 1,250 housing units currently, and we have an increase in the pipeline of 2,750. So I get a sense, oh, it's about a 6 percent increase, and we talked a little bit about jobs and how much that has increased. Um, but do we, do we have a quick sense of how the other job, uh, retail and office to compare? So the question is, based on this new development recent and in the pipeline, like what percentage increases that of retail floor area or commercial or industrial square footage like how much of a how much have we grown over a certain period of time um, we don't have that data for you today but we will have it uh, for the next one yes I'll, I'll do my best to make sure i ask staff <laughs> questions in between meetings so that we can get as many answers as possible um and also I, I noticed that the public didn't necessarily see the briefing book just now, so I'm gonna try to make my last question a little more general, um, even if you haven't seen the briefing book. Um, I, I guess there, there was a slide that talked a bit about um, San Mateans and their commute, and we, we saw some slides that talked a bit about how tough 101 is. Um, and so I, 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 am, I don't even know if this is a question, but I guess I, I, well, I, I did have a question about whether we had this sort of data about how people are getting to San Mateo to work, as opposed to how San Mateans are going out of the city to work. Um, just making sure we're, we're keeping it holistic and, and getting a sense, because um, it, it seemed like the information in the briefing book talked about how are San Mateans uh, you know, you know, for example, if I'm coming, going to work, we know how I go to work because I live in San Mateo, but just making sure we're, we're capturing. I think, the answer, I think the answer is we know at the county, uh, county level. So if you're in San Mateo County, we know how everyone is getting to work in the mode split between single occupant vehicle, carpool, bike, whatever. But I don't think we know of the, so there's like 52,000 employees in the city and only 13 or 15% are San Mateans staying. I don't think for those other 85, we have disaggregated it from the county data to know which ones of those are the ones coming into San Mateo and then we can say the mode split for them. So I think the answer is we know the county and we know kind of the overall picture. We know us and going out, but we, I don't think we know the in commuters mode split the same way. I could be, I hope to be wrong and I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think, I don't think we have that. So um, we're working on existing conditions report, including circulation. And so we'll take a look at that. Um, we'll also see if there's any information you know, regarding jobs, you know, where people 
people who live here but work elsewhere, because that might give us some indication, even if it's not trips, you know, if they're working uh, somewhere else. That, that, that we have, that's in there. So we'll yeah, we get that. piece together the information somehow and uh, present that information with the distribution. So we'll add that question in. So my question is on the actual schedule itself. Um, you guys talk about that team. You're going to be having community input, um, pop-up sessions, and working with community partners um, to have sessions. But in when those dates and those locations are presented and selected, are you going to include them in the schedule? Yes. 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 And would that be so? Would that be be visible to all the public as well? Okay, thank you. I am going to go maybe a little bit off of the suggested format there, too. Um, I want to make sure that, and these are things that were already brought up. Regarding outreach, I want to make sure that uh, there are a bunch of people who don't normally participate in processes that we undertake here in the city. And I really want to make a strong effort to reach out and have a very creative effort to reach people um, who are hard to reach and hard to draw in. Like I described earlier, some people feel like there's us and there's the city. Okay, we need to convey that we are all the city. Okay, and we need, and I do this all the time when I meet groups. I, uh, I mean, I was speaking to a Guatemalan group the other night at City Hall, uh, and uh, what I conveyed was, listen, we need you to come in and take part in our city government. I'm going to be doing a, a meeting with uh, students from the uh, Smart School, the San Mateo Adult School. And my message to them is get uh, involved, take part in our um, uh, 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 immigrant uh, uh, government class that we do. We run a special class to introduce people who are new to our city um, and or our state or our country uh, to our local government. Local government is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, this is where things that make a difference in your daily life happen. And the things we're gonna talk about here during this process are going to be some of the most important things that you will have happening in your life in terms of here where you live. So that said, I want to also talk about, um, for the PowerPoints we talked about, I would like to see anything as to PowerPoints and anything else come out to everybody and made available on that uh, uh, website that we have. Um, I think we need to be sure to take a look very closely at possibilities and opportunities of the future. Um, that, that may or may not be evident right now. I, I think right now at this point, we're looking at as far ahead at 2040, in a world where change is happening faster than ever before. And some of the possibilities that sounded crazy just 10 years ago are happening now, right? We need to be very um, far-reaching in, in what we plan for. And I know we can't plan for everything, right? We'll have to make some decisions somewhere. But we need to have all ideas on the table. Um, so that said, no idea is a stupid idea here. Things to be considered uh, should be mentioned and thought about. Um, autonomous cars, um, uh, additional train service, parking, the future of parking. Um, I think that when we look at, for instance, what I just mentioned, the changing transportation world, the way people get around, we could end up in the future with parking structures that are no longer needed. We need to plan for reuse of those areas. We need to have a plan because they're they're in vital areas in our downtown and other other you know places where it makes a difference. I know of one development right now that's already planning for reuse. It's a proposed development, and it's planning for reuse in the not too distant future of what is currently being planned as garage space. Constructed okay. garage in a way where it can be in a way where it can be converted. Okay, so. Uh, so we need to be fearless uh, also with our vision zero thinking in regards to our complete safe plan. We need to uh, step up our efforts on uh, having safe and healthy um, environments. So streets that are safe for bicyclists, pedestrians, as well as all the other users. One of the things I've been talking about for a while is we might need to slow traffic down. In some places, 25 miles an hour is just too fast. Um, also, um, We need, so uh, in terms of what I heard about needing to, to improve the ability for the public to make their comments, um, I am in favor of thorough you know, uh, input, but I do respect the fact that we only have so many hours of the night to be here. So I agree that we should allow the public 
at least two minutes. Uh, I'm more in favor of three minutes, but uh, and some people still think that isn't enough, I know. But it, I think what you mentioned, Julia, is important. People who have more thorough, in-depth comments they want to make should send them in, and we should all get them. And they should be made available to the public so we can all be on the same page. We don't have to hear it all here at the meeting, though. Um, deeper dive on data. I'm really in, uh, into data, okay? So I agree with that comment. Uh, it's hard to figure out what you need to do without data. Uh, it's just a data-driven data world now. Um, and uh, well, like I said, change is the only constant. Um, the city needs to plan for the future with flexibility, and but we need a plan. The plan needs to allow flexibility and the ability to adapt because adapters thrive. Okay, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, and I just had a couple um, questions. One was, is there a list of the agencies that we're going to be working with on this? Um, we will compile that list. Um, a lot of times uh, we will hear or get invitations, and so if you don't mind, we can share that, and then just know that that's a running list that will get updated as we uh, get additional invites and make additional connections. And then um, I do want to echo a lot of the comments here as far as additional study session meetings and can we come up with a list to maybe talk about by the next meeting of potential days to have those where there's an open mic and people can come for an hour or whatever and be able to speak without a, a formal agenda. So I would like to see that if that's possible. And that said, that brings us to the public comment period. How many speaker slips do we have? So we have at least 30 minutes if everybody gets two minutes to speak. And one, one you all know this, but one way to make it easier and quicker is if someone has said something that you were gonna say and you agree with it, say so. Um, you can also add your own twist if it wasn't quite exactly what you would say, but um, please note points of common concurrence. And, um, we keep um, the facility needs to be cleaned up and we need to be out by 8.30, and so it does take staff some time to uh, So we're hoping to end at 8. Okay. This process is real important, and it's important that it be done in very high quality, and that it be done on time. And I'm thinking about the end of 2020 when there could be a vote uh, you know, on the ballot for extension of Measure P, and we need to have a real alternative. We've looked at all the data, we've got all the input from folks, and we you know, can put an alternative out there. That's what this process needs to be. I think you know that the housing and, and, uh, and the uh, traffic are the key issues, and I think the last point is the Sierra Club, we have a set of guidelines that we're finalizing, we're updating on downtown plans. We'd like to present that. I had proposed before that maybe a 10 or 15 minute presentation of this group might work. Maybe there's a different format that you'd like to use. But I think getting input from Sierra Club and other uh, organizations that have you know, some real in-depth input to provide would be helpful. Thanks. Hi, I'm Thomas Morgan. And um, kind of the thing that brought me here tonight was uh, I heard earlier at city council meetings about having carve-outs. So uh, I just felt that it would be important if there are carve-outs that those areas, should they happen, be kind of more responsible to provide more of the affordable housing so that the other areas, you know, we do have the 10 percent, we're talking about increasing it, but the areas that are given the, the privilege to build denser and more, they should take more of the burden. And then in the smaller areas, then maybe there's a project that can happen and maybe they don't have to provide or they can just provide the fee to help offset that cost. and. Uh, I'd also like to see, I've kind of been working on both sides of the city, east and west side, and I would like to see a much stronger connection between the east and west side of the city. Uh, there's talk about a bike bridge at Hillsdale, but I think there's also a need somewhere between 3rd and 92 as well, because it'd be very easy for me to just hop on a bike bridge to go over to the Shoreview Shopping Center, for, as well as walking to downtown. So just things like that, having a much stronger connection, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay, this is, uh, we were 
My name is Jean Marie Houston. I'm a lifetime resident of San Mateo, um, and I'm speaking this evening on that topic of child care. Um, a number of you have already heard this message in various venues, um, but with regard to the general plan, child care uh, is a quality of life issue, it's a livability issue, it's linked to many elements in the general plan, economy, housing, transportation, parks. Um, child care is the second highest cost of living for families next to housing. Um, Young families with children, we want to be in this community. As we build more housing, we're going to get more families. They're going to need child care. If they have to get in their cars and go elsewhere to find it, that's a congestion issue. It's a circulation problem. We have data right now. We have a recent state-mandated child care needs assessment that we can make available um, for review that documents very clearly the shortage of child care in every city in, this, in the county specific numbers for the city of San Mateo and the growth projection for 10 years out. Um, I just want to thank you for this work um, and ask you if you could just continue to think about the child care issue. I know I have other colleagues in the room who may bring this up. Um, I also want to laud the city for putting in a developer fee ordinance. It was very far-sighted. It was the only second community, I think, in the county that's done that and just sort of use that as leverage as we go forward. So that's all I I don't want to use more time. Thank you. Thank you, and I agree. So I'll cut my comments in half. Um, <laughs> good evening. Um, I just wanted to say hello. I'm the director of San Mateo, a Build Up for San Mateo County's Children's Initiative, and of course, a San Mateo County resident. Um, Build Up's a new initiative that's designed to grow and improve the supply of childcare and preschool facilities in San Mateo County. So, some of you may not know this, but there's a shortage of almost 11,000 spaces in San Mateo County, and that's about a thousand for San Mateo. So um, we are really excited to participate in this public process and we're grateful to San Mateo as she um, just said you know for being um, so proactive and having the um, development fee and we um, child care impacts so many items related to the general plan everything from housing to traffic development transportation workforce the economy and then in turn of course that impacts all of our families um, here, so we just want to ask you to keep thinking about child care. It does intersect so many issues, so as you go forward, just keep it in mind, and I'd be happy to submit a formal letter to staff or work with you on getting input or any way we can be helpful. So thank you so much. Hi, I'm Adam Nugent. Uh, I'm a new resident of San Mateo. My wife and I just bought a house this summer. Uh, we chose San Mateo because we want to raise a family here, uh, and we love the vibe. Um, I'm also a landscape architect, uh, and I practice in California. I'm a licensed landscape architect. Um, and before that, I was a U.S. Army officer. So I've been all over the world. Um, and I also studied in Germany, which is right now leading the way in sustainability. Um, when we talk about quality of life, I think it's really important that we, um, and we talk about participation, um, I think it's really important that uh, we also show people good examples of what other countries, what other cities, what other towns are doing, um, because I've experienced density in, in Doha, Qatar. It's not fun. It's gross. It's disgusting. I've experienced um, quality of life in the same amount of density in Germany, little towns, like villages, that have that are super walkable, and they are the most pleasurable places to be. Like uh, it's it, it's night and day. Like America, if only we could do that. And I think San Mateo actually has a very strong chance of doing that. And we can do that by uh, increasing the amount of housing available. Uh, and we can do that uh, while we are still feeling flush, uh, and provide uh, housing options for all people who want to live here. Um, and then finally, I also want to say, we talk about data. Um, I'm also a member of Strong Towns, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that's national. 
and they look at our development patterns and how they affect um, municipal budgets. Um, the suburban lifestyle that we have in America is new. It's not something that has ever happened. Uh, we have traditional uh, walkable patterns throughout the world that developed independently. Um, and, oh, sorry. Oh, sure. And I just want to invite everybody to come to strongtowns.org and watch uh, these, the, um, sorry, watch the curbside chat. Um, it's by a, a planner and a civil engineer. Uh, watch the curbside chat, please. <laughs> I'm not just an alley. Uh, Justin had to leave, so uh, I told him that I would uh, present a truncated version of his remarks since they were awfully long. Um, but first, I want to say how much I appreciate all the comments that have been made about the importance of data uh, within our organization, which is one San Mateo. We uh, have advocated for better data on the housing problem. Uh, we believe that it is essential to understand the problem and gauge on how well we're doing in addressing it. So, um, as I said, Justin and I are both members of One San Mateo. It is a community group that works for a fair and inclusive community. Uh, and our special focus is affordable housing and civic engagement. So we believe that uh, the greatest issue facing our community today is the dire lack of affordable housing, and it probably will remain the pressing issue for years to come. So we hope that through this general plan process, San Mateo will take a wide-ranging look at all aspects of the general plan that can be adapted to better facilitate the creation of affordable housing. We are looking at revising height and density limits. We hope that in doing so, uh, coupled with an increase in the DMR policy, that we can figure out how this can allow for nonprofit and for profit developers to increase the numbers of affordable housing units that are created. And where there is public land, we strongly believe that this should be reserved for 100% affordable housing developments. Finally, one of the things that we feel passionate about is that whatever changes might come out of this plan, no single neighborhood should be disproportionately impacted. As a city, we must all bear the impacts of the necessary changes equally. And in order to assure this equity, the, the city needs to engage in a very robust process to engage as many different neighborhoods and constituencies as possible. Thank you. Dan? Dan? I don't need one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, hi. I've got a prepared statement with the hopes that I'll be within the two-minute limit. Uh, my name is Keith Weber, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this valuable community discussion. The downtown plan process, which took place over the last two years, was deeply disappointing. It was a process, it seems to me, that began with the premise that downtown is little more than an economic opportunity. The historic core, the symbolic center of our community, and our single most valuable asset was left as an afterthought when it should have been a starting point. 2019 marks the 125th anniversary of San Mateo's incorporation. We are a mature city with deep roots and a valued past. And that community value is embedded in our built environment both commercial and residential. A responsible vision for our future can only be achieved if, if it values our past as an expression of our community identity and our collective self-respect. If our general plan is to be a long-range statement of community, priorities, and values developed to guide future public decision-making, it needs a holistic and sustainable premise. The first rule of the medical profession is do no harm. 
If the committee begins with the premise that community heritage is an irreplaceable asset that should be preserved and protected, economic opportunity will follow. A good example can be found in our current general plan, which, and I quote, confirms the city's commitment that the protection, enhancement, perpetuation, and the use of historic structures are of economic, cultural, and aesthetic benefit to the city of San Mateo. I'm almost done. I hope also that if outside professional speakers will be invited to make presentations on transportation, development, density, et cetera, that one evening can be devoted to historic preservation consultants who can inform the public on the economic and cultural benefits of identifying, preserving, and protecting our historic resources. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Payton. I live in the central neighborhood area and I'm very new to this process so I'm really going to ask a question which I haven't yet to get the answer to. And as I look at the growth of these um, <clears throat> apartment and condos that are sort of springing up everywhere, I see mainly the downside. Uh, the things that we've talked about, uh, you're going to have to increase police, fire, there's a new wear and tear on the roads, you need more teachers, you need more city employees to handle it. You may get a sort of an uninvolved populace, not the kind of thing that when I hear what people said they valued about San Mateo and what they thought they would like to move here for, um, it sounded more like they wanted a community than sort of this transient population that lives in these little studios and one bedrooms that they're building for the dot coms. And uh, when you think, the, the only answer I have gotten so far is, well, we need more affordable housing. But when you hear about affordable housing, Lots of times you, they'll build 10% and it's not affordable, it's just below market rate, which is not always affordable for the kind of uh, services that we need in our community. And for the diversity of classes, so that we don't all want just a bland upper middle class income population, that's when not. It's, it's a more interesting diverse community. So my question is, with all these downsides that I've seen, Please tell me the upside of this increased growth and push towards higher density if you're not going to answer the affordable um, housing issue. Anybody? Probably have another minute. Um, sorry. So we're going to do what we said earlier, which is save all the questions until the end, and then we'll either Charlie or I you know, will respond to the comments collectively. So right now we just want to make sure everybody has a chance to uh, voice their comments and their questions. And then we're taking notes. Thank you. Okay, Maxine Turner. She will be followed by Heather Cleary. Okay, I will be very brief this time and cut out a lot of words. Um, and pick up on your data requests because I agree how important that is because I get so frustrated when I hear words and I don't get the information behind it. For example, jobs housing balance, high density transit oriented development without talking about what transit we're talking about, and Caltrain electrification. Is this really a solution to having more high density housing along transit? Let's be open from the start. Save some time and money. Where are we talking about higher heights and densities? How does that relate to our vision? Doesn't density relate to whether we're building housing for families or dormitories for tech workers? We need a way to explain to people. Nobody knows what density means. So let's be honest when we get to that conversation and I'm glad that we're going to be looking at the vision first 
because if we continue to be a family-oriented community, that will relate to a density that can allow a range of housing types. We all know the devil's in the details. Uh, over 10,000 people in our community, but specifically we have two early learning centers in San Mateo serving over uh, 65 families. So I specifically invite you to Peninsula Family Service for outreach uh, to, to talk to many of our staff and our clients who you probably wouldn't get to talk to in many other ways. Um, I'm here to talk about a few things. I am a San Mateo resident. I've raised my two boys here, lived here for over 20 years. Uh, and I specifically want to talk about child care. There is a huge need to add more child care in our community. Uh, unfortunately, right now, too many children are starting the San Mateo Foster City School District at kindergarten already behind. They have already hit the achievement gap. And unfortunately, many times teachers look at them as unachievers or uh, children with issues when really they didn't get their delays dealt with earlier and they didn't have the experience of a quality preschool center. So I encourage you all to include preschool as well as infant toddler centers in your general plan, uh, as in the parks and rec department, but also when you approve new buildings, commercial buildings, look to add child, to child care facilities as part of public benefit. Secondly, on a separate note, on transportation, I highly encourage you to think about better bike routes between San Mateo and Foster City. I know there's a 3rd Avenue overpass. It's really hard to get to the 3rd Avenue overpass, and it's really hard to get to the Bay Trail after the 3rd Avenue uh, overpass. And I would love to be able for my kids to bike to practice in Foster City. And that is not possible today, but it really could be possible tomorrow. And taking all those families who bike or to carpool to Foster City and back for soccer practice um, off the road would be a huge rush hour relief to many. So thank you all for your service. Thank you. Hey, this is Hi, uh, I'm again on behalf of the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Please just scream at me when my two minutes are up because I have a lot to say. Um, so so one, the question that we want to ask and we want to ask throughout the process is, how does San Mateo promote equitable, affordable housing that is inclusive and diverse? So that means we have to think about um, the city's current residents. Um, th that includes renters, retirees, people with disabilities, people who grew up here and want to stay people who work here, um, the children of the people who work here, our future workers, our future neighbors, all those people need to have access to decent quality affordable housing. Um, and our school teachers and retail workers, people that provide services for residents here, they can't afford to live close by and that has that has a lot of impacts including most, most noticeably traffic. It also impacts the success of local businesses um, and and the liveliness of our downtown and, and other areas. Um, another big question is, what makes a workable city? Um, you know, San Mateo has over 100,000 residents, so uh, it's, it's not exactly comparable to Belmont, uh, which is noticeably smaller. It has more um, strip malls. Um, but there's a lot of competing factors that are required to make a city work. So, so how do you create a vibrant, healthy, livable, pedestrian-friendly downtown, as well as vibrant, livable urban areas that are adjacent to transit? These are hard questions. I'm not, I'm not envious of you all. Um, but to have a vibrant downtown, for example, you need a successful mix of restaurants, retail, and entertainment. And to make sure those businesses are successful, you need retail workers and foot traffic. And that requires housing um, that people can afford and in places where it's convenient to walk or bike. So how do you provide housing that people can afford? Subsidies are part of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll pass a bit later. <laughs> Good evening, uh, subcommittee. Um, so I am Chelsea Benini, and I've lived in San Mateo for 17 years, and I have two boys, and um, 
Four of you in your introductions mentioned schools, which was great. And I know Ellen has a special affinity for our schools, having served on the school board just like I did for four years. Um, so I encourage you, I hope that you will, even though there is a school board, and there are two in your city, in fact, that you will engage with them um, or include them in your conversations. The city will make that a reality because we talk about it a lot, but it's not really been very effective in many years. So um, I think it's super important to keep that in mind. There are impacts for the schools. Yes, the school district will decide where to build um, and all of those things and work with the city, but we have a lot of demographic information that can be shared. We have a lot of things we can collaborate on. So I'm hoping that that's a, a focus. There's a, a impacts on housing. If you have more family housing, more families, the growth. Um, and also after school programs, and I'll echo the preschools because our district, the elementary school district, does have preschools as well. And then I would also just um, comment on the, um, and applaud the, the comments on the outreach and making that more accessible. We have a lot of things in place already through the school districts where parents are, and I would venture to guess that those are people who are not typically at your meetings because they're at home, especially parents with kids with special needs. For instance, this evening there's a PTA meeting for those kids, but it's hard for them even to get there. But it's really important that you, you find them. Um, and then I wanted to just lastly just echo the importance of the dialogue. And also um, what I find to be the most exciting and um, important part is your deliberation. So I hope that that is a big part of what you do and that you really use each other for dialogue as well as listening to the community. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nancy Schneider, also a longtime resident. My two girls were raised here and went to school here. But actually, my comment is more, and I'm also a Sierra Club member and echo what Ken said about our guidelines. But my comment actually is more on the transportation and circulation issues. Um, it seemed like just briefly going, what was presented and re briefly going through the the handout that we're really focusing on work trips which I think is a mistake we need to focus on all the trips the school trips non home based trips I was I've done transportation modeling and home based work trips are probably the least number of trips and it's also one reason why the peaks has changed because people are driving all through the day for all their different changes all their different trips and needs um, and that's also one thing we need to work on for transit which is not a San Mateo um, only but that we can't just have transit that work that serves work trips because that doesn't work getting you to the grocery store I mean it doesn't work for other things the other thing is I do have a question um, on on the process of since San Mateo is landlocked, well not landlocked, but is surrounded by other communities, how the general plan decision making process takes into account the neighboring towns and communities, um, especially transportation, but all these other things, um, jobs, housing, and everything else makes a lot of difference um, being able to talk to the other communities. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Jordan Grimes. I'm a lifelong resident of 19th Avenue Park here in San Mateo. Um, yeah, a lot of what I was going to talk about has already been spoken to, so I'm going to try and go down the list here. Um, so the first thing, obviously, that is on pretty much everyone's mind is the housing crisis. Uh, and one of the, <laughs> in, in doing some research uh, on housing in San Mateo, uh, recently I discovered this really great, looking at old microfiche, uh, I discovered this really great article from the San Mateo Times, which is now defunct from 1985. And the title of the article is 1985's Big Issue, What Else? housing. Um, so it really does put into perspective that our housing crisis is historic um, in more ways than one. We have spent decades upon, we have spent decade upon decade upon decade not building enough housing, building a lot of office space. And what you see is young people like me still living at home with our parents because we can't afford to move out. Or when we do move out because we don't have uh, rent controls or price controls here, 
we get a $450 a month uh, rent increase like I did and we end up moving back in with our parents. Um, so that's a big thing uh, for me. There are a lot of different ways to address that. Um, one of the things I'd love to see discussed is uh, rezoning potential, um, potential to build triplexes and fourplexes uh, that we don't currently allow. Um, I'd love to see uh, really underserved communities getting brought into the discussion. Uh, seeing the eastern half of San Mateo really uh, given a stakeholder place here. Um, I have a lot of neighbors on uh, South Grant who live in who live in those apartments who um, who I know very well uh, have come to know very well over the years who who aren't represented here um, and definitely looking around are represented here tonight. Yes. Um, just the last thing I want to say is there's this idea that the development is increasing the cost of housing. What is really increasing the cost of housing is the shortage of housing. Uh, we have a vacancy rate of 1% or less. It, it hovers depending on the day. Um, when you don't have enough housing, people can charge more money for that housing. And that's really the key. And I really hope that we look into that going forward. I have two short points to make. As I've listened to this meeting and other meetings with the councils, I keep hearing the refrain, we want to hear from as many people as we can. Well, I would strongly suggest that you define the people that you feel are essential to hear from in demographic terms so that the place work people can make sure that their outreach is successful in hearing from enough of those people that they can actually make statements as to what those groups are interested in. And it's a hard decision to make, but once it's done, you'll have clarity in whether or not you've succeeded in getting it to the people that you really care about. Second point, I want to add a little bit to the comment someone made about uh, school involvements. The, the, the only comment I saw in the scope of work said we're going to check to make sure that the alternatives that we devise for land use planning we understand the impact on the schools and I think that's a good thing to do but I think there should be a lot more because when you look at the valuation of the San Mateo is a great place to live imagine what it would be like if we had crummy schools thank you <laughs> was why the woods and pool data is so much higher and the answer is something you actually touched on which is, is it captures all the self-employed residents who don't have a place of employment that they're going to and from so so these job projections the difference is that's everybody that isn't being reported by an employer separately um, let's see we had a question see Nancy you also had a question about how are we surrounding involved how are we involving surrounding communities so it's a couple ways one is um, any any community, Hillsborough, Foster City, the county that's got a border will be involved through the sphere of influence discussion. So every city has its city limit, then it has a sphere of influence in which um, it's determined over the planning period of the general plan. Urban services might be provided or not. It could change the city council could ultimately decide to shrink or, or grow it. If it grows, it usually involves um, the local area formation commission, which is in charge of all the annexation uh, procedures. So naturally by notice of our hearings and discussions the other cities will be notified how to what extent they'll participate we'll see and the same will be true of all the agencies with jurisdiction like caltrans and the department of health um, bay area quality management district etc um, let's see there's also a question gene i believe it is asked about very small units and what purpose they're serving and adam actually kind of talked briefly about how there's a whole range of things whole range of housing types that actually benefit a community and, and one of the questions that somebody else asked, which was, I believe, um, where did I put it? Oh, Maxine asked, you know, we need to know what density looks like. So one of the things that we will bring to you at various points is, you know, what do you like that you see here? I think we're gonna stay away from Doha, at least, unless someone really suggests it. Um, um, but, you know, there are different ways, density can look very different, right? You can have craftsmen villages, or you can have high-rise houses. You see it, you know, you see pictures from around the world, around the, even just around the Bay Area. So this issue of what does density look and feel like is just as important as how big or small the units are to how these places function. And I think one of the things you'll hear from trans-oriented development advocates is 
the more opportunities you put, the closer to transit, the more people can self-select and have a range of things that they want um, that, that fits their lifestyle. No one wants to be told what, I guess there's two, there's two basic tenets in planning, right? Um, there's two things people know they don't want. One is density and the other is sprawl, right? So, okay. <laughs> and, then, and then the other one is, in, in planning, nobody likes to be told what to do, but we all know what's best for everybody else, especially right near us. So I think, I think you know, it, because planning is kind of a, such a socialistic function in our capitalist society, we always kind of have resistance to, oh, it's rules, and we have to follow these rules. But we all also know that we have planning, and we have local governance, because if we were all just left alone without any rules, we probably might not do the right thing all the time by everybody. And so I think the core answer to your question is, the more we can do to provide the more housing options, the more live, work, and play options as close as we can to each other, but also to, to high quality transit, which can just be a bus that runs every 15 minutes during non-rush hour, and someone mentioned that, um, the more we're gonna give people options to make choices. And there's some really interesting things that have been done to show that choice is a big part of this. I might get these numbers wrong, but about 10 or 12, maybe even 15 years ago, the Pena Institute in San Jose did a um, study um, preceding one of the gas tax increases. Gas tax increases. And so this is before, I mean, this is like when the RAV4 was the only electric vehicle, so it's quite a while ago. And they said, well, so would you, would you agree to, would you be willing to tax yourself an extra, I don't know, a third of a cent or half a cent at the pump just to support these future technologies, HOV lanes, autonomous vehicles, clean fuel vehicles, better toll crossings, 80-20, no. Would you do the same thing if you could be cooler than somebody else by making a choice that made you pay less than they did, either own an electric vehicle or carpool or whatever, and it was 80-20, yes. And it was really basically the same, same question, and the real suggestion was people, are, people want to participate in positive change, but they want to be able to make that choice themselves. And yeah, there's this part where I, I do want to feel better because I, did, I made a choice that I think is better for the environment or whatever. But it just tapped into, we, we, all, want, we all do want to help. We do have this tendency of knowing the right answer for everybody else. But, but on a very serious note, um, it's really about making choices and giving people the chance to make a choice that they know is going to make a better quality of life for themselves, but also for everybody else. I think that was an answer to a question. Um, <laughs> and I think... Heather, thank you very much for your invitation. That's exactly what we need uh, for people to say, I'm a part of an organization, we want you to come talk to us. So thank you for that. Did I miss anything? Uh, yes, sure. Schools, have we reached out to schools at some point this way? Uh, we, we will and, and we will actively do that. Um, and someone made, raised a really good point. When we, when we go around the stadium, we work in places where the schools are not good, that's all you hear about. More than traffic, more than housing. What do you do for the schools? What do you do for the schools? So. We're very fortunate to be blessed to be in, an or in a place where the school districts are great um, and it's fine tuning. But yes, the schools are a very important key player in this and we will reach out to them repeatedly. Um, we talked about the different school districts, but I think most people here were referring to, you know, the elementary and high school districts. Will uh, the community college district be a part of that? Yes. So. yes. So I probably should suggest to the chair too, um, for protocol, since we're in a Brown Act meeting, if, if you believe that public comment has closed, we probably should hold questions until next time or get them by email and answer them before. It's, it's your... In the interest of time. Yeah. 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 Could I ask you all to please put your question in an email and you will ask my question. Ah. Yes. It's a process question. If I send an email with more information, the questions I didn't have time to ask, I send it, who do I send it to? How quickly will it go to the committee and be put online? Or is it going to be filtered and sat on in the black hole? So, and she can filter the questions that you sent in to the proper person to get you an answer. So just um, for, you know, just for public disclosure, um, when we provided the information, uh, we did get one email from the public that was provided in yeah to the committee um, and so anytime you provide us with a written comment we will organize it we're not going to e-blast the committee with you know emails every single day but we will aggregate the materials and then do like one blast you know so you know we're also trying to be respectful of the committee's time in terms of all the emails that you get but yes if you send your emails to me letters you know whatever you know no ten written notes we'll try to decipher um, but yeah, send it to me and then we will organize and forward all of the communications. We will not edit, 
you know, your email, your letter, all of that will be forwarded, um, you know, to the committee, and then uh, we will try to, if it's an email and you're sensitive about your email being in the public, let us know, we'll go ahead and white out your email so it's not posted online. <coughs> Do we have time? Do we have time? Questions by the committee? Yeah, do we miss anything? Yeah. Okay. Do you have a question? Um, I just have a question in terms of um, the timeline of the meeting. Um, I, 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 I actually um, told my wife that I was going to be home at 8 15. She was counting on me to be back. And I don't mind um, obviously staying here as long as it needs need to be, but I would like to try to stay on time, so if we need more time, then let's budget it in. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. I have another process question about just community input, and there are several interest groups that have spoken and said that they have presentations and information and reports that they want to present to us. What is the format that that will be received and, and shared? Um, I would say, you know, reach out to me if you're interested in doing a presentation, we can work that through. Like I said, there's eight meetings um, for this committee. We can add additional ones if that's necessary. Um, part of the reason for suggesting, you know, a fixed date in a month is that it'll give us the ability to squeeze in additional meetings if necessary. So we're hoping that, you know, that fourth Wednesday of the month, you know, works out uh, for the committee and we can start planning with those dates. And I, I would also just follow that by suggesting that um, if it's something of community-wide importance, it might actually be appropriate for a presentation to the council. You know, the mayor mentioned the SMART school, and we actually, Carrie and I, had the good fortune to be here for a meeting related to the general plan the last time the SMART, I think the last time the SMART group came up and they gave a presentation, it was really uplifting, and, and I would say there may be some, some items where it's really better for the entire community than just this process, and we could, we could talk about that too. So, and then there are other things like requests for data, like for example, shifting, um, shifting or expanding the trip counts to include non-work trips. Like, where are we capturing that? Those kind of discrete suggestions so, in this um, format. Again, you know, uh, anything that's been verbalized is recorded, so we'll have those questions and suggestions in. Uh, we will try our best to look at data sources and then you know, present that back to the committee. Um, so I think you know, the best thing is if you have questions about data, you know, put it down in writing so that we can start looking into those, those you know, uh, answers. We have or the public? Anybody, okay. And then as a, as a preview, you know, our next meeting, you will have seen in advance and we will be going over the quote existing conditions reports and we will have folks here that generated those reports from the traffic side and, and others and so if you, have, you, you, there may be questions you're asking that will, will be good for them to answer on camera in front of the community and, and it might be more interactive than just one, one quick question to answer and might go further in the discussion. I have a, a quick request for the uh, community members who come before us, uh, including uh, the advocates that uh, focus mostly on the regular community members who don't do this for a living. Uh, and I was a lobbyist in a prior career. So, and it's, it would be to raise the complaints, raise the concerns, raise the goals, but if you can focus us on any methods and means to actually uh, make improvements, uh, that would be really helpful because we all can go down the list of complaints, but uh, and I personally am not here to be an advocate for one, I want to assimilate these ideas and take the best ones and suggest they go in the update. That would be a great help. Sure, I guess I'll just thank the public for being here. Um, and I am gonna just sneak in a quick question about whether um, we're gonna get another opportunity as a committee to look into the briefing book even. And I feel like um, due to time constraints, we, we so will we be able to do that in the next meeting? Yeah, I think um, we had intended to give it to you tonight, let it digest and, and simmer over the next uh, period before the next meeting and have that be the basis of some questions, comments. But I think you'll see the briefing book is at a pretty high level and pretty much just says, you know, in many ways what we said tonight. The existing conditions reports are much more detailed and you'll want, I think you'll want to look at them in combination. 
because really what the briefing book and other products like it through the process will do is just focus discussion. So when we have a vision meeting or an alternatives meeting, everyone will have kind of a common shared you know, platform to work from and plus their own experience. And so if people are actively listening to each other about what's important to them, looking at the data and saying, well, the data means this to me as opposed to the data just has value in and of itself, that'll be really helpful. So none of these, pro none of these products die or go away. They're all useful in the conversation but I think you'll see when you see existing conditions reports the kind of the different levels of information that people will have access to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to stop staying up so late. Thanks. <laughs> that sounded like a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Are we set to adjourn? We have our notes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. For thank you all for a very, very, very productive discussion.